after the Bitcoin conference in Amsterdam, uh, the day afterwards, I'm having an interesting talk with Christopher Endern from BTCX, an exchange in Sweden, or not an exchange, a broker. And um, he's got a very interesting AML checking software, which we're going to discuss in a separate video. But I really was interested to talk to him about because he started in 2011 when the, when the Bitcoin was $1 and when Mount Cox was happening. So we're going to talk a little bit about that history, how it was to start a company then in, uh, in those days and how you, could, uh, how you could buy Bitcoin and sell it and what was happening there and then, um, and then what, his, uh, what his plans are now. Okay, uh, I hope you enjoy uh, the, the rain in Amsterdam uh, at the moment. Really nice showers here, <laughs> foggy and cloudy. Yeah. Hey, you were a uh, PhD student in, um, in, in Sweden and um, of, of uh, quantum, uh, quantum or no, what was it? Uh, Qu quantum biology. Quantum biology. And then you stumbled onto, uh, onto Bitcoin uh, in 2010 or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. What happened? Well, I, uh, I like open source, so I went to a open, free open source software meeting and uh, people were talking about open source money. I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. So. Uh, I actually downloaded the Bitcoin client mm -hmm. um, at that time, it was early 2010, and then uh, started mining the same night. Okay, and if you were mining with a laptop or something like that, or with a desktop or something, how many Bitcoins would you get uh, every, you know, per day or something like that? I mean, it wasn't... For, for, for if you look at the amount of Bitcoin you got, it was quite a lot. Uh, I don't was it like five Bitcoins or one no, no. Bitcoin a day? Or? No, 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 not, not. I mean, I had a laptop and uh, it was CPU mining. Yeah. It was just before the GPU mining took off. Yeah. Um, with my GPU, I got one Bitcoin a day. Okay. But with, uh, with the CPU, I think it was maybe 0 0.1. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Something like that. And, and how much was the Bitcoin? No, it was a dollar. It was a dollar when you got started, right? Uh, maybe half a dollar. Maybe half a dollar. Yeah. And then when did you decide to say, hey, let's do some business with it. Let's make a brokerage where people could buy Bitcoin in, for Swedish kronen. So basically, I wanted to buy Bitcoin myself. And I realized that I had to send money to Japan. Uh, the, the biggest exchange at that time was Mount Cox. Yeah. And it took me seven days to send money. I sent like uh, 100 euros or 1,000 Swedish kronen. Uh, it was Swedish corner in Sweden, so it took seven days and it costed me like 200, uh, tw like 20 euro or even maybe 25 euro. So I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> this is really crappy. I mean, that was basically my first global payment I made. Yeah. And then I bought Bitcoin and Mt. Gox and I took uh, a, a withdraw, mm -hmm. send to my Bitcoin wallet. Mm -hmm. And it was instant. I mean, the transaction, I, I barely touched my, you know, click on my uh, mouse. Yeah. And well, the, the signaling was in, in instant and you had to wait 10, month, 10 minutes for confirmation. No, no, no. At that time, people didn't wait for confirmation. Really? Yeah. So instantly when the transaction hit the mempool, mm -hmm. it was in, in your wallet. Oh. Because the double spending uh, mempool problem wasn't, I mean, people were becoming aware of it, but it was not really a problem. Okay. Yeah. So you're going, wow. Yeah, it was like, bam, from seven days and costed like 25 euro to like zero seconds. And the, the cost of the transaction was ridiculous. I mean, it was like a thousand of a cent. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, nothing. Just now it was lightning. Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but on chain. Yeah. You, you can have it now again if you go just move to lightning, okay? Yes. And then and then you said, okay, I can do this for other people. Yeah. So what kind of what kind of uh, setup did you make? And you programmed it yourself? What what was what was the setup? Yeah. So I just started something for fun. I took a WordPress blog. Uh, I can do some coding. So I hacked some PHP code, and uh, a week later I had a site or. A week later, yeah. uh, we we launched, or I launched in uh, January 2011. Uh -huh. I did some other stuff uh, during that, yeah, 2010 year at, as well. Yes. But the uh, the actual WordPress hacking and putting making a logo and just make it available just just yes. took a week. Yeah. A week, yeah. And then what did you have? You have WordPress. Okay, you can buy Bitcoin. You can buy Bitcoin at my website. Yeah. And then uh, what did you do? Uh, people could send money to your bank account or something like that. It was everything was manual, or did you yeah, make yeah. it already database driven? Yeah. And, yeah. No. No. I mean, the first MVP was totally manual. So it was just uh, I got an email to my mailbox and say, "Hello, here's a customer who want to buy 
by Bitcoin. Yeah. And uh, so some of the parts were automated. So the the customer got an email with payment instructions, and he. Um, at that time, I started with one bank, and then I opened an account in all Swedish banks. So yeah. for a while, I had a com uh, account in all Swedish banks. Yeah, it was easy to get a bank account in those days. Yeah. Wasn't it wonderful? Yeah. How many bank accounts do you now have? Now that you're in business for a long time, you're publicly traded. How many banks do you have in uh, in, in Sweden? Currently, the exchange has zero accounts. And 2011, <laughs> we had seven. So now all our banking relationships are international. Yeah. So we have one in UK, one in uh, Luxembourg, uh, uh, Liechtenstein. Okay. So uh, it's not a light regime in Sweden uh, in terms of uh, Bitcoin support. No. So I mean, Sweden just to get a sense of how anti-Bitcoin it is in Sweden is that the the the, the general uh, of the uh, I mean general director of the financial authority flew down to the European Parliament mm -hmm. just before the Mika was to be finalized and said we want to ban Bitcoin mining. Um, we're from Sweden and we demand to have banning of Bitcoin mining. Because of environmental reasons or because, yeah, that must have been. That must have been the reason. Yeah, well, we can only speculate what the reason, what reasons are. No, but mining, mining people ban because of, uh, exchanges people ban because of you know, money laundering and that kind of, but, but mining is always for energy reasons and for climate change and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that they don't like mining and, and, and also, but they have an exchange. There, how many exchanges are there in Sweden? Basically two. Oh, there are two. There's, there's two. Yes. But real proper exchanges where you can oh, have... right, right, right. No, no, zero. Zero. Yeah. Okay. So, so you, there's a place like you, you can buy Bitcoin and send it to your, uh, no custodian uh, business, but you can send it to your own address, but there's no exchange. No exchange. There, there is a, a registered Swedish exchange, but they operate outside of Sweden. So they're not really Swedish. They don't, they don't support Swedish Krona. Yeah. So okay. it's... Uh, but in 2011, life was wonderful. You could get all the bank accounts you wanted and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then how long before you automated the whole process of interacting with banks and tracking payments and blah, 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 and to make it easy? So I would say each year we automated another part mm -hmm. and it took, I mean, 2011, the volumes were quite low. Yeah. 2012, it started to take off. And 2013, when we had like the really, when Bitcoin went from 50 to 1000, yeah. then it really took off. I mean, the, we had to hire people every day just to do stuff. Yeah. Uh, what was it at the high point? Uh, how many people had, did you have at those days in 2013? I think we were I mean, we were still a small company, but maybe we were we went from five people to fifteen people in in like a month or yeah. two. And who did you hire? Students from your friends or what? Uh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> people, but but people. I mean, since we were the only one in Sweden operating, yeah. people came to us, so it was quite easy to find find yeah. people to. Things to were wonderful, and of course, then it went from a dollar. You went from a dollar to a thousand dollar, and 2013 was. Life was wonderful and yeah. fantastic, and then what happened? So, 2014, the Mount Gox crash yeah. came, and that kind of hit the market uh, with a nose style. And at that time, also, now the government and the banking started to... Notice. Yes. So that's basically when, when the hard period started. Maybe it started a little bit earlier, but from 2014 and onwards, then it was clear that the banks did not like Bitcoin. No, they started to notice. They started to see it as an as an as a as a competing kind of ecosystem, and uh, and they, and also because all, then also did other. I mean, I think Ethereum came in 2015, right? It was, so it was still still very. There were not many other coins at that point. So you had in 2013, everyone wanted to be the better Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So there were maybe, let's say a thousand competitors, everyone with their unique value proposition, um, like faster blocks, smaller uh, uh, transaction block. I mean, yeah. all kind of shit, yeah. basically. And all of them failed. Yeah. Basically, I mean, what's still left from, from that time is, yeah. is Litecoin and Dogecoin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Dogecoin, yeah has it doesn't have a technical advancement but it have a cute dog so it, it yeah. basically survived some nice supporters yeah i mean 
<laughs> what I noticed from that time on all Bitcoin meetups there were 100% guys. Yeah. And then I went to a Dogecoin meetup. Yeah. And there were, uh, I said, oh yeah, babies, children, mothers. I was like, what is going on? I was like, wow. So that was actually, Dogecoin was the first branding experience you had in that world. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like using a meme to, tar to marketing a currency was a genius. Uh, ah, okay. but, but, but I met the founder a few times in, yeah. in, from California. Uh -huh. and he said, he wasn't even serious. No, it wasn't a joke. Exactly. <laughs> but people love a good joke. Yeah. Or a no, but I mean, also, you, you noticed, hey, branding is important, right? Definitely. Yeah. And then uh, show me your car, because, I mean, I think, uh, because, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, Christian and I basically love, I mean, we, my first experience was I bought 100 bitcoins for 7 euros a pop. And then, uh, and I bought a Tesla Model S, and he also bought a Tesla Model S. And it cost me 100 bitcoins at 700 a pop. And you were also going to buy uh, the Tesla for 100 bitcoins. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what, what happened? Yeah, I, I was lucky. Tesla was uh, running a, a campaign sure. for a car loan. And, and he, he's, got the, he's got the number plates for bitcoins. That's really, <laughs> I think that's really fantastic. What a great investment. Uh, yeah, so, and th so you wanted to buy uh, for 100 bitcoins. You wanted to buy also a car just like, did, yeah, and I yeah. did it and you did? Yeah, so, uh, but I only d need to pay 20% down payment and the other day I got a, a loan from Tesla for like one, one, one and a half, uh, 1.2%. So that, that saved you 80 Bitcoin, so yeah, I was yes. stupid and I didn't do, <laughs> I mean, I should have done that. I had the money lying around in Fiat and I left, I thought I was a brilliant investor buying Bitcoin for $7 and selling it for $700. So I'm really bad at that stuff. <laughs> okay, so, but then there was the winter, okay? There was the winter, you basically crashed yeah. And of course, volume went down. And uh, what did you do uh, to survive that? And, and what did you think? Was this the end of Bitcoin, or because you were not used to those kinds of things in those days? So I, I think the first really crash I remember having the, it was actually be before 2013, uh, and that was 2012 when Mt. Gox had a flash crash. Oh. So the price of Bitcoin, I don't know if it went from like 20 or 30 down to almost zero mm -hmm. and I was actually sitting in front of my screen watching the red bar going all the way to zero and I was like <laughs> what is going and I, I had I mean I, I'm a tech guy or a math guy yeah. quantum biology yeah. ne I had have never heard the concept flash crash I didn't know what it was uh -huh, yeah. until then I, well I you know I kind of learned yeah. so Bitcoin for me has been a, just a long education in, in global uh, finance and uh, trading yeah and unpredictability of the market right I mean it's, yeah. we only if you set up a system like that and so many people are interacting and systems are interacting it's very difficult to predict where it's going it's yeah. really hard to do okay so you had a number of these winters yeah. and of course in the winters we innovate right yeah. that's that's the idea yeah. uh, so what did you do so the first winter 2014 that's also when we got uh, we also got off boarded at that time from off boarded from our bank oh, yeah. so we had the winter we had the Mt. Gox crash we had th that's where we had our first clash with our with our bank and realized okay the banks doesn't really like what we're doing so we had to um, staff up on compliance so that that was the first kind of wake-up call that we need to be more diligent mm -hmm. than the banks mm -hmm. otherwise they will not touch us so that we had to rearrange the company do more Getting in lawyers and stuff like that, all the the, the boring stuff <laughs> <laughs> and tough stuff. It's really tough. It's much easier to make good software and then and to Definitely. make good documents and make good procedures and make processes and adapt to the fiat uh, rules. It's quite hard and expensive. It's super hard and super expensive. And uh, from my experience, it's also extremely complex. And even if we even though we took in the best that we could find in Sweden, they had no clue how Bitcoin worked. So we also had to be really good in educating the experts and finding a, a good, like, where, how do we work with Bitcoin? So the banks are satisfied, the governments are satisfied, and that basically comes down to the product we're offering now.
which is basically uh, an a AML product, anti-money laundering product for crypto. Yeah. That is already Mika approved or M M Mika adapted, I would say. Yeah. We're going to talk about that for in a little bit more detail in a separate video because I think that's nice for people yeah. to because AML, you know, just and, and having tools for AML is, is really important. So that's good that that comes out of the innovation. But in the meantime, you also said, okay, well, then in 2017 you got another, you got then things went through the roof again. So yeah. how how did that happen? But what what happened then in your company? You had prepared, you were organized, you still had a Swedish bank left to yeah uh, yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So 2017, we were more prepared for, for the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't, I mean, it was really hard to, to know exactly how, how the hype would unfold. Yeah. So this ICO hype that happened during, um, during the summer 2017, and then, then really spiked later that year, that kind of was new for us. I mean, we could see others offering all those tokens and coin and pre-sales and white papers. But one thing that I had learned during the, the, the previous cycles, I mean, when, when everyone was competing for a better Bitcoin, everyone failed. Yeah. And I could see the same thing is going to happen again. Um, but some evolution always happens. So Ethereum, for example, it's still around and has a use case for smart contracts. Some people think that it's just for gambling, mm -hmm. but it still have a value proposi proposition other than Bitcoin. Yeah. So we are focused, we, we offer Bitcoin and Ethereum and don't put so much energy in all the other stuff. Not so much energy or no energy? Well, we, we still have customers that do want to spend time doing that. Yeah. So we help them kind of here is uh, like in educational wise. Yeah, yeah, but you don't have any products and you don't sell uh, no. other coins. Okay, no. good. And then say, okay, then, then you had that thing and then, and, and then it, it crashed again. What, what happened when it goes up? You're very busy uh, onboarding all kinds of new customers. Yeah, yeah. Did you do KYC at that moment in 2017? We did. We, we actually started KYC 2012, 13 already. Yeah, so you did that. And then, and then the crash happened again. So yeah. what happened with that? Uh, did you, what did you learn from that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically it, it was the same thing all over again. Uh, so we cut down on expensive, try to focus on core business and uh, get ready for the next hype. That's basically, we're in the same position we're in right now. Yeah. Um, You're first at 21, okay, so then 21. Did you feel it's happening all over again? Do you feel you recognize it and, and or do you also think, it's, think, that's, think that things change structurally? So the, the major shift I would say is happening is that 2013 Bitcoin was its own economy and before 2017 it was blended with uh, I mean the crash 2017 came in December and it matched kind of the same week when big corporation they want to close their books like it's the end of the year we want to take profit or take losses mm -hmm. and at the same time Bitcoin crashed yeah. So it's like kind of end of the year. End of the year. Yeah. But now the the Bitcoin ecosystem is even more in integrated with the financial system. So now it's 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 a, it's a different animal. It's a blended. It's very hard to predict. And now it basically crashed because of the the, the general you know political situation. It was not the end of the year kind of thing anymore. It was yeah. about so all kinds of wars and inflation and pro uh, after COVID kind of things. Yeah. yeah, much much more complex. Yeah, and of course it was ten times bigger again uh, in terms of size. You know, it was it it's, it grew to three trillion, and then it went back to one trillion. But already, uh, do you, I don't know how big. And on the high point of, well, actually, I mean, Bitcoin is now at the at the level of 2017, at the all time high of 2017. Now yeah. it's there, so it's probably is about the same uh, size. And then you thought, hey, um, let's do something else again. Let's go public. Yeah. <laughs> As a company with 15 people in Sweden, why would you go public? It sounds like a huge amount of work, another bunch of lawyers and all kinds of stuff. Why do you do that? Yeah, it, it is a lot of work, but it's also a, a, a good uh, flag, you could say, of, of credibility. 
uh, for example, some of our uh, customers or becoming customers, they cannot do trading or, or business with, with a, a private company. They need to have a public company that's approved in some way. Yeah. And being publicly listed on NASDAQ, even though it's a Swedish, uh, Swedish Nasdaq, not the American. It, it gives you the credibility you need to to do uh, basically next level business. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do people now think you? Are the banks are going? Oh wow, wonderful! You're now a public company. Come back. Uh, we will. Uh, we will. We want to have you as as one of our respected customers. So the the the, the, the funny part with this is that probably I mean we actually got off boarded from our bank again. After getting public, we got, I don't know, like 12, 15,000 shareholders. We got some uh, insurance company invested in us. Yeah. Uh, so we thought, okay, this is really good. Yeah. And then suddenly the bank came, sorry, we want to close the relationship. And it had nothing to do with you, it had just to do with general rules. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So it was like, come on. <laughs> and it's like, okay, so it's happening again, but seven years later. Yeah. Okay. So in the next video, we'll talk about the product you've created out of this uh, crisis. I mean, is the uh, AML software which you have created uh, to test to see if all kinds of transactions are legit. Is that, is that, uh, come, does that come off going public or does it come off going Mika or where did this product, uh, which we're going to discuss in the next video, but uh, how did the reason, why did that get started? So basically, um, there was a company coming to us. They, they, uh, it was a, uh, one of the bigger gaming companies, computer gaming companies in, in Europe. Uh, they had made an NFT drop uh, and made tons of money with that. But when they came uh, to their bank, they said, hey, look, we have a few millions uh, worth of e Ethereum. Yeah. The bank said, no, thank you. They had a Swedish bank, by the way. Uh, so they, then they came to us and asked for help and we said sure we, we could help you with this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it was just some customer, it was not, not going public, not going, uh, not going to, to have a relationship with the bank, it was just a customer coming away. Okay, so what is the future of uh, BTCX? What are, you, what are you going to be, you know, preparing for the next hype and in the next three years what are you going to be? So the focus right now is for attracting more computer game companies to become their crypto partner. Because we think uh, digital worlds, uh, I don't want to say metaverse, and definitely not meta, but real computer games, they are finding out about crypto. And now is the time for them to do crypto adoption. Okay, but they all want to start their own coin. You're going to help with that too? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's that's one part of the business. But you're also totally you went to some kind of an island in front of Africa. Where, where what is that story? Oh yeah, right. So uh, me and some friends we uh, met up uh, Bitcoin uh, meetup last year, and uh, they not me, but they had contact with the president in Madeira. 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 It's in it's in uh, the far out, outermost regions of EU. Uh -huh. So basically, that's how far away you can get and still being in EU. You're in the EU, okay? But it's in Africa, right? In front of it, where is it? In front of uh, Madagascar or something? Not Madagascar.